Amen. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you once again. Seems like a long time, but yes, such a short little time that we've been gone. And so it is good to be back into uh, the cold weather. And uh, sorry we didn't bring any warm weather with. We did, but uh, we used it up on our way home. So, <laughs> so you have to wait till springtime. Uh, it was good. We, uh, 29 of us went down to Belize and uh, God... Uh, Use, use that, I believe, in our lives and the lives of those that we were there to minister. And so I think most of them came back. I mean, or maybe all of them did. I'm not sure. We forgot to do a head count when we came back. <laughs> so but I think most of them are back in Canada. So, but it is a privilege once again to be with you. And a greeting to those that are watching via live stream who would love to be here, but for some other reasons just can't. And so, but uh, we're glad you're able to join us via live stream. I want to uh, invite you to take your Bible to uh, turn to Psalm 63, a verse, a, a psalm that is perhaps familiar to us, for, to a lot of us. And it's a very encouraging psalm. I trust that this morning will be an encouragement to us, and it will just draw us closer to the Lord, and that we'd have a greater uh, love for Him, uh, that we would walk away from this place, not just having done our time coming to church, but the Holy Spirit of God will have gotten a hold of our hearts and challenged us and changed us. There's no point in coming to church if we're not ready to listen to hear what God wants to do in our lives. And so I trust that each and every one of us this morning will apply perhaps what the Holy Spirit of God will teach us this morning through His Word. And we're so thankful that the Lord is always at work. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun the good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we have the promise of God working in our lives. There's never going to be a time in your life as a child of God where God is not working, doing His transforming work in your lives. The only problem is many times is we hinder the Word of God. We hinder God working in our lives by our disobedience or not heeding to His Word. And so I trust that every one of us here this morning, we've come here with a heart that is prepared to receive what God has for us. Excuse the messenger. Look past him, I pray. And just ask that the Lord would do a great work in our hearts as we look to the Word of God and as God wants to minister to each and every one of us. And so, if I talk fast, please listen. I'll apologize to uh, the translators later or maybe in advance. I apologize for going fast, but um, for some reason I just feel like uh, we need to speak. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, pray for me as I try to deliver a message uh, with clarity and... Uh, with ease. Amen. Psalm 63. I'll read the entire psalm. And uh, it goes in verse number one. It says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power in thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with, thy, with, thy, with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on, on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by, thy, by the sword, they shall be a portion for the foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God, every one that sweareth by him shall glory by the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the wonderful privilege that is ours once again to come into your house. Father, we have a wonderful opportunity to read from your word, to hear the word of God. So, Father, I pray that our hearts would be in tune with you and what you desire to do in this place this morning. Father, it has already been prayed that you would protect us, and Lord, that there be no distractions in our minds and in our hearts or in the auditorium. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would just have complete freedom to do uh, the work that He wants to do in our lives. And Father, would you teach us to surrender and yield ourselves to you fully and completely. And Lord, that this morning that you would again do that work uh, that you want to do in our lives once again. We thank you for this place. 
We ask, O oh God, that you would truly be honored and glorified through all that is said and done here this morning. And we'll praise you and thank you. And we ask it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in the, uh, this psalm, we see the psalmist, uh, of course, is David. He wrote this psalm. And uh, many times when the uh, psalmist would be writing, he would be writing based upon perhaps some experience that he had gone through or some trials or some victories or whatever the case might be. But here we find the psalmist in the wilderness, and we're not sure exactly why, uh, what the cause of him being in the wilderness is. It could be that he was running from his persecutor, Saul, as we know from the life of uh, David, uh, he had um, a persecutor. Saul tried to kill him a number of times. In many years, Saul, or excuse me, David would be running for his life from uh, because Saul wanted him dead. There was some jealousy that crept up in Saul's heart, and and the uh, and the story of uh, of how Saul wanted to destroy David, and David would have to run for his life. Or it could be uh, in this case that he was running from his own son Absalom. I mean, what a, tra- a, tra- a terrible way to live. How having to run from your own son, your son wanting to kill you and take your life. But whatever the case might be in this situation, we find that David is in the wilderness and he's crying out to God for his help. And aren't you thankful that this morning, whenever we cry out to God for help and strength and wisdom, God is always there to help us. He is never far away from the children of God. He is always with us and we see that in the life of David. You know, when we look at the life of David, and David's life was full of ups and downs and trials and victories and and testings and things of that nature. And yet we see the life of David. And David had so many things that happened to him in his life. We see the the great victory that God allowed him to have when he fought, when he challenged Goliath to a fight. And we see the victory that God gave uh, to David. We see that how uh, we see in this uh, situation when he's crying out into the wilderness, how that he was running and perhaps running from his son Ab. Can you imagine as a father having to run for your life because your son wanted to take your very life? And we see that the trials that David was in. We see for a, a, in another incidence of how David was tested and how he was tried when uh, his family was taken. The wives and his children were taken when they came back to Ziglag and the men, his trusted men that he was with. And when they came back to Ziglag and they realized that their wives and their children had been taken and the city had been destroyed with fire and the men that he trusted they wanted now to stone him and we see the trials that David faced you know what we face trials in our lives it might not be to the extent that David has faced but every single one of us we face trials in this life in this life we will have tribulation in this life we will have trouble but I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ said that he has overcome the world amen he is our savior he is our helper he is our guide he will never leave us nor forsake Take us, but nonetheless, we are, however, we still face trials in this life. And the, me- the title for the message this morning is Choosing to Walk with God. Now, this is something that you and I personally have to choose to walk with God. No one is going to choose for you to walk with God. Now, we might have parents and teachers and pastors and things of that nature that will help us and that will instruct us and that will encourage us to walk with God. But every single one of us here this morning, we we have to make a decision to walk with God. And that's the, uh, besides salvation, that is the most important decision that we make. And that's not just a one-time decision that we make. We don't just uh, set a New Year's resolution and say, uh, this year in 2023, I'm going to choose to walk with God. My friends, it's a choice we make moment by moment. It's a choice that we make when we get up in the morning. We say, I will choose to walk with God. And it's a choice that we need to make consciously and we need to make that decision uh, from the heart just like David did and so many men and women that we read about in the word of God. Their circumstances did not allow them to choose whether they were going to walk with God. I mean, you look at the life of David and the trials that he went through and the heartache that he faced and and perhaps the many uh, people that were against him, but he still chose that he was going to walk with God. And my friend, you and I, we need to choose to walk with God. David David faced many trials. There were things that God was doing in David's life 
that David perhaps didn't understand at the time. And it's no different in your life and in my life. There are things that God is doing right now in your life that we may say, I don't understand what God is doing. I don't understand the trial. I don't understand the difficulty. But understand this, God is still our God. God has not forsaken His people. And God will see us through this life no matter what we face. But we must choose to walk with God. This life is like David chose to walk with God in the midst of his trials, in the midst of the difficulties. And we have this wonderful testimony of the life of David in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, where the Bible says, For David, after he had served his generation by the will of God. See, David fulfilled the will of God in his life. Now, if we fulfill the God, God's will for our lives, that does not mean that our life is going to be without difficulties. It's not going to mean that our life is going to be problems-free. Sometimes as much as we would like to not have trials and difficulties in our lives, we sometimes say, Lord, if these trials weren't in my life, if these difficulties, if you would just make the path smooth for me, I would be a better Christian. I would, have, uh, I would be able to serve you better. But God knows our frames. And you know, it, uh, you know it as well. What happens in our lives when things are going well? When there are no trials? When there are no challenges? We forget God. It's just our nature. And God allows trials into our lives. And what many times happens in our, in our Christian life, when God allows trials into our lives to conform us into the image of Christ, many times we fight these trials and say, God, get these things out of my life. I don't, I, I don't want this trial in my life. Rather than to stop for a moment and say, okay, I understand God is working in my life. I understand God allowed this trial in my life. God, what, it is that, what is it that you want to teach me in this trial? Instead of trying to get out of that situation, we see this in the nation of Israel so many times when things would go well with the nation of Israel and God would provide their needs when God led them into the, uh, into the nation of, or into Canaan. God warned them. He said, before you get into this country, into this land, it's going to be a land that floweth with milk and honey. It's going to be a great place. This is something that God wanted to give his children. And he says, it's going to be a wonderful place. Uh, there's going to be houses there. there yeah, you don't have to build. There's going to be vineyards. It's going to be a rich, rich land. He said, but just one thing, I'm asking you one thing. When you get into that land, don't forget about me. Don't forget about your God. Don't forget about the one who gave you all these things. Don't forget about the God that led you out of Egypt and led you through the wilderness and fed you for these 40 years and he clothed you and he gave you water to drink and manna from heaven and he protected you and he fought your enemies for you. When you get into Canaan, then don't forget about me. And what happens when they got into the land of Canaan? They forgot God once again. And you know, it's the same thing in our lives. It's, it's just our nature. When things go well, we have the tendency of forgetting God. And when God allows difficulties in our lives, many times He gets our attention. What happens so many times when we're walking away from God and our fellowship with God isn't what He wants it to be and perhaps we've become a little bit backslidden and perhaps we become a little bit careless in our devotion to God and our service to Him and we get kind of callous towards the things of God. And what happens when God allows problems into our lives? Oh, we call back on to God and say, God, we call on Him and He comes and He helps us. And trials are good. Trials are not to hurt us. And we need to understand that when David was going through his trials, it wasn't that God was trying to hurt David. It was that God was molding a man that God could use greatly. It could be here that you're here this morning and you're facing some trials or perhaps some difficulty. Or maybe you're going through something that you may not understand why God is allowing this to take place in your life. Give God an opportunity to show what He wants to do in your life instead of trying to find the quickest way out of that problem. Many times we find ourselves wrestling against God trying to get out of that problem. But God wants to do a great work in our hearts. You know, just like we need to choose that we need to walk with God. And whatever comes into our lives, we need to understand those circumstances should not dictate to us, whether, uh, dictate our walk with God. We need and we must make that choice. It has to be a conscious choice, choosing to walk with God. Just like Joshua challenged the nation of Israel in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, as they... Uh, 
as Joshua addressed the nation, and he says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. He says, choose you today, not tomorrow, not next week, not a more convenient time. He's confronting the nation of Israel, and I believe God is confronting us on a day-to-day basis. He says, choose today whom you will serve. Uh, in the nation of Israel, as Joshua challenged them, they were to choose the day that they would uh, serve him. He says, choose you this day day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, of, or the gods of the Amorites, in, whom, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, a verse that we know well, we have it in our houses, we have these verses um, perhaps on our doorpost in our house, and it says, as for me and my house, here's a choice that Joshua made, he says, I will or we will serve the Lord. Have you made that choice this morning that today you will choose to walk with God? Is that a choice that you have made? See, it's not going to happen on its own. You walking with God is not going to happen by happenstance. It's a conscious decision that you and I make that we will walk with God. And it's a wonderful life walking with God. There's no other life rather to live than to walk with our Heavenly Father. Now, how can we have have this close walk. As I've said before, every single one of us, we choose how close we want to be to the Lord. It's our decision. How close are you this morning to your Savior? How close is your walk to your Heavenly Father today? How real is He in your mind and heart? To a lot of Christians, he's nothing more than a figment of our imagination. He's nothing, you know, they, they equate him to some fairy tale, someone that you can see. Perhaps they equate him to a Santa Claus, perhaps. Uh, they, they heard of him, but, but he's just not real to, to, to many of us. Is God real to you as he was to David? As we look in a little bit further. But how do we have this close walk with God? Uh, and, and I believe the key to this psalm and this, uh, this chapter, the psalm, is found in verse number 8. Psalm 63, verse 8. And I think if we would apply this truth, this principle to our lives, I think it would help us in our walk with God. He says, My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. See, you and I, we're going to have to choose if we're going to walk with God. It's a, just, it's a decision that we're going to make, and as I said before, on a daily basis. And David made that choice. And number one, first point this morning, in the time that we have, number one is choose to know God. How are we going to walk with God? We're going to have to choose to know God. You say, what does that mean? Psalm 63, verse 1, and the psalmist says, A psalm of David, when he was in their wilderness, of Judah, and this is his cry, O God, thou art my God, thou art my God. Do you know who God is? You know, we hear about God, and perhaps we've grown up in church, and we hear the stories of God. We know that God is the creator. We know a lot of facts about God. We know some of the things, and you know, when we read the Bible, we see the things how God has worked in the lives of other uh, people and in times past. But let me ask us this morning, do we know God in a personal way working in our lives? Let me ask us a more personal question. If we were to ask for a, a raise a, or for a testimony, how God has worked in your life, do you have an answer to a specific prayer? What could you say this morning how God has worked in your life? Or is he just a general God? See, God wants to be your personal God. Just like David. David, he said, oh God, my God, he is my God. Is he your God today? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are a child of God? You say, well, isn't God everybody's God? No, God is the creator of all things. He is the creator of all beings, but he is not everyone's God. See, this is a choice, a decision that we make. We receive him as God offers himself to us. And when we receive him, the Bible says to as many as received him, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God. So let me ask us this morning as we're here listening to this message, is he your God? Do you know God as your Savior? Is he a personal Savior today? Uh, to you today? Can you go back in time and you say, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, this was the day that I was born again. Just like Nicodemus when he came to Jesus and Jesus said, you must be born again. See, being born, uh, to become a child of God is not a process. It's not something that we, that we produce in it out of ourselves. It's not in going to church. It's not in reading your Bible. It's not in praying. It's not giving money to the offering. It's a decision that you make to receive the gift of salvation, which God has provided through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to as many as received Him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Do you know this morning that God is your heavenly father? We may know a lot about God, but do we know him as our savior? Talking to some people in uh, Belize when we were there sharing the gospel. And I was talking to one lady in the, uh, in the hotel there. That was working there, and I asked her, and she was struggling in her life. She had gone to the church there, but, but she didn't know if she was saved. And I asked her, has there ever been that time in your life that you recognized that you were a sinner and that, and that you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life and to save you? She said, well, I pray, and I, I said, that's not what I'm asking. I said, has there been a transformation that took place in your life? My friends, there has to be that awareness that God came into our lives and made a radical change in our lives. I remember the day that I got saved, and, and I, I'm not talking about feelings and visions and things of that nature. I remember laying there in the quietness of our, my bedroom there, and I remember talking to God and praying and asking Him to forgive me of my sin and to save me. And I remember that moment when Jesus Christ moved into my life, and He made a change, and my eyes were open, and I knew from that moment on that I was a child of God. October 29th of 2000, and that day, that time, that that moment is clear in my mind. You may not have that clear uh, moment in time and place, but you ought to know that, that you are a child of God and that you too can say, Oh God, my God. He is my personal God. He walks with me. He talks with me. When I read the Word of God, His Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am the child of God. And when I'm walking through this life and I'm walking at work or in a school, wherever I am, I know that the Holy Spirit of God is with me because He speaks to me. He convicts me. He guides me. Do we know my God? Can you say that? Oh God, my God. See, if we're going to have a close walk with God, we can't have it apart from knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that He is our God. And you know what? Many Christians struggle with this very truth. They struggle. I'm not sure if I'm a child of God. I'm not sure if there's been that time. Oh, why not settle it? Why not settle that so important uh, question? Am I a child of God? My friends, if when we have that settled, you can go to God with confidence. You can go to God with assurance. You can cry, Abba, Father, and God will hear His children. Amen? We that know God, God knows His children. And we can cry, Abba, Father, and God is a wonderful Father. Do we know Him? Do we know Him as Savior? And then do we know Him as our God, and our, as, as our Father, as we walk through this life? You know, as I said before, we all have troubles and trials and struggles and decisions that we make. But God never intended the child of God to go through this life without his help. When Jesus went back to heaven and the disciples were discouraged and they were, they were somewhat discouraged. And he said, I will send another comforter. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to be with you. And today as a child of God, my friend, the Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of us. Do we know Him? Do we know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Do we have that communion with the Holy Spirit of God? Is that real to us, to us today? Or how is our walk with God? Do we look at the Word of God and do we see how God so mightily worked in the lives of uh, these characters that we read about? And we look from the outside, perhaps we're looking through a glass darkly and say, Wow, I wish I could have a relationship like that as the Apostle Paul did. 
Oh, I wish I wish I could have a relationship with God the way Joseph did. I wish I could walk with God the way David walked with him. I wish I could walk with God the way Elijah walked with him. I, I is it just we looking from the outside trying to look in and just I wish that was me. We make that choice. The choice is ours. Choose you this day. We need to choose whether we're going to work a walk with God. You say, well, you don't know my situation. You don't know my home life. Did we not just hear a little bit about David's life? Can you imagine your son coming after you, trying to take your life? Can you imagine Saul throwing a, uh, a, a javelin at you, trying to take your life? Running from Saul like a dog, hiding in caves, hiding in the wilderness, and, and not understanding what's all, what's all taking place. He still chose to trust in God. Can you imagine the life of Job when everything was stripped from Job's life, his wife, his children, his land, everything that, that, that God had given, God had taken back. Can you imagine uh, the life of Job? There he was sitting in his sores and his boils and his ashes and he had his miserable friends come and condemn him and accuse him of sinning and, 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 and all these things and this, these miserable comforts that he has. He says, yet I will trust God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hey, he made a choice that he was going to walk with God. What's dictating your life whether you're walking with God? What is it in my life that dictates my walk with God? I need to choose, say, I will walk with God. I will not let circumstances to, to hinder my walk with God. And again, it's not in our own strength. It's not in our own power. But it's a decision we need to make to trust in God. And as we see in the psalm here, as we'll read here a little further he says uh, oh God thou art my God early will I seek thee my soul thirsteth for thee my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is and so David said I am longing for God I am hungering for God what are we hungering for uh, for today where is our focus do we need to choose to know God do we know him or do we just know about him you know, this is one of the, Paul's great cry, and I've quoted this verse many times, and I'm trying to understand it. I'm, I'm trying to apply this truth to my life and this prayer in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, where Paul cries out, that I may know him. See, Paul knew Jesus Christ as a Savior. He's writing this as a child of God, but he had tasted the goodness of God, and he wanted to know more about God. I trust that our desire is to know more about Him. I trust we haven't come to the place in our life where we have reached a plateau in our lives. Say, I am satisfied where I am with my Christian life. My friends, do we have a desire to know more about His grace? Do we have a desire to know more about His wonderful life that He wants to impart in us? As this song, uh, the, song the hymn writer wrote, More about Jesus would I know, more of His grace to others show, more of His saving fullness see, more of His love who died for me, more of His holy will discern, Spirit of God my teacher be, Showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus on his throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom surely increase. More of his coming prince of peace. More. More about Jesus. More. More about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Do we have a desire to know more about God? See, our walk with God, we're going to need to choose to know God. My God, God, my God. And then secondly, we need to learn to choose to praise our God. We need to choose to praise the goodness of God. In Psalm 63, in verse 3, it says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life. How much do you value your life? I mean, life is precious, is it not? A man will give everything for his life. And here, uh, here the psalmist says, because thy loving kindness is better than life. Some of us Christians, we're so attached to this life. We're so attached to this world that, 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 we, don't, that we, fail to miss, we fail to see the goodness of God. 
that God wants to bestow upon His children. And the psalmist, he recognized that, that the goodness of God in his life. My friends, do we praise God for the goodness of Him? of the goodness of God in our lives? Have we stopped and thought about the goodness of God in our lives? And as the psalmist goes on here, and he talks about meditating on his bed, about the goodness of God, do we take time to meditate on the goodness of God? See, we're so bombarded with entertainment today. Everywhere we go, where we look, there is TVs, there's monitors, there's phones, there's distractions. We're so bombarded that our mind never has time just to be still and know that I am God. Our mind is so full and it's always going, it's always going. We're never giving God an opportunity to, 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 to show His goodness to us. When is the last time you've laid on your bed and just meditated on the goodness of God? We're filled with the news, the negative news that the world portrays as always bad news and bad news and bad news. My friend, we have good news. We have the goodness of God to meditate. Many Christians go through this life discouraged because they're constantly feeding on the negative of this life and the things of their circum or thing, uh, the circumstances of life rather than focusing and meditating on the goodness of God and praising Him for His goodness. Amen. Oh, do we praise God? God. My soul, in Psalm 63 in verse 5, he says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Oh, can we praise God for his goodness in your life? Do you know the goodness of God? Do you recognize the goodness of God in your life? Psalm 63 Verse 6, he says, When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. We wake up in the morning, our phones are beside our bed, many of us perhaps, maybe it's just my own personal testimony. We wake up, the, our phone is beside our bed. What do we miss? And we carry that thing around us we go to bed, it's right there. Perhaps TV, computer, our minds are always engaged in something else. We play on our tablets, look on our phones, fall asleep, giving God no praise, not even meditating on the goodness of God throughout the day. And we wonder why our lives aren't full of joy. And we wonder why we're not walking in victory, wondering why we have to go to church and why, why life is heavy and hard. Psalm 107, verse 8 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for the wonderful works to the children of men. Do we praise God for His goodness? Do we praise Him? Is there any evidence in your life, if you were to pass away and uh, your children or your spouse would go through your things, your books, your journal, your Bible, would there be any evidence that would give them that you praise the Lord? Is there any memory of God's goodness? Is there any thinking about God? Or what's our minds filled with? Oh, that men would praise the goodness of God. How close. See, we need to choose to praise God. How close we want to walk with God. Praising God will draw us into His presence. will magnify the Lord. And then lastly, we need to choose to be satisfied. Psalm 63, 5 says, My soul shall be satisfied with, with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. So many Christians are just not satisfied. See, God has blessed us with so many things in this life in, in North America and specifically. And we have so many things to be thankful for. We have so many things that God has given to us that would satisfy us. 
But yet we find many times we're not satisfied with the things of God because our walk with God is not what it ought to be. See, when we're walking with God and we're, uh, we're, we're, we have a close relationship with Him, then and only then are we satisfied with the things that God wants to give us. But if we as a child of God, we're walking through this life and we're not satisfied with our spouse. We're not satisfied with our church. We're not satisfied with our job. We're just not satisfied with life. Is it God's fault or is it our own fault? Understanding that God gives us good things things to enjoy in this life we can have perfect peace with God doesn't matter where we are we can live somewhere in Belize we see perhaps some of you have seen some of the poor areas that we took pictures of and where people are living in poverty and they don't have anything and yet we see people in North America who have everything and we see people the same we see people that are satisfied with nothing we see people satisfied with everything but we have to choose to be satisfied with the things that God has given to each and every one of us Are you satisfied this morning where God has you? Are you satisfied in the church that God has you? If you're not satisfied where God has you today and you're you're in the house of God, it's not God's fault. It's our own fault. We're looking to things that God doesn't want us to have. But we can be satisfied. God wants us to be satisfied. He wants us to experience the abundant Christian life. And are we experiencing that this morning? Many Christians walk through this life and they're not fulfilled. They don't have the joy of the Lord. When people look at our lives and they say, Christians are supposed to be some of the happiest and joyful people on the face of God's earth. And sad to say, many people walk through this life. They're just not satisfied. They're looking to the things of this world that never satisfy us. And Jesus said, I will give you what you need. And many times we think walking with God and having the peace of God and having the fullness of God is, is doing things for God. We think that we'll be satisfied if we have more money. We'll be satisfied if I have this. And understanding those things that were never given to us to satisfy. Jesus says, I want to be your life. I want to be your fulfillment. As the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as he went through this life, he said, God is all that I need and all that I want. But is it the same for you and and for me this morning? Are we satisfied with Jesus Christ? If God were to take everything from us, if he were to take our job, our wealth, and the things that we've accumulated in this world, would we turn to God and curse him? Or would we say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? What satisfies us in this life? What do we run to for satisfaction in this life? Do we need more toys to be happy? Do we need more things to come to church? Is it, is the, does, does the preacher have to bribe us to come to church? Oh, if you come to church, we have a special gift for you. What satisfies us in life? Are we satisfied with knowing Jesus Christ and walking with Him? My friends, there is no disappointment when we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and we're in tune with Him and we're walking Him step by step and we're talking with Him and God is communing with us and He causes our cup to be full and to overflowing. Are we satisfied with the Lord? See, sometimes we have this idea in order to be happy, in order to be having a close walk with God, we've got to do all these things. And, and if we're not, sometimes we have this idea that God is a taskmaster and he's got all these stipulations laid out and, and all these to-do things that we need to do. And, and we think that if I do this and if I read my Bible more and if I, if I do this more and if I give more and I serve more and I do this and, and we run around and we're busy and we're just not satisfied. You can do all those things that I just mentioned and still come out completely empty. See, God is not a taskmaster. What did Jesus say to those that were falling? He says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He says, come unto me. He says, I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he says. God wants to spend time with us. And to have a walk with God means that we're going to be satisfied with Him. And my friends, when we are satisfied with God, when He becomes our all, serving Him is great, great joy. It is never a chore. When our service to God becomes a chore, it is then that we need to recognize we're not walking with God. 
what a great joy it is to serve my wife. Why? Because I love her. And she has great joy in serving me. That's where you go like this. Thank you. Because she loves me. When we walk with God, we have that relationship. Anything God asks us to do is a great honor and a privilege and a joy. But so many Christians, they have to serve Him. And I say that because we force ourselves to serve Him rather than allowing the power of God to work in us and do the work that He wants to do in us. I'll close with this for in, in verse number 1 again, in Psalm 63. It says, O Lord, Thou art my God. That phrase there, my God, is in reference to His power and His strength. See, we choose to serve God. And when we choose to serve Him, God enables us by His power to do exactly what God wants us to do. And then it becomes great joy and a great privilege serving our great God. Amen.